Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Wynn, and I'm at Twitter. I'll be talking about RSE, Scala outlining, and how it all plays into distributed compilation for hopefully faster Scala compiles. So first about me, who am I? Why am I giving this talk? Um, so I'm on the language tools team at Twitter. And yesterday, my t fellow team member, Olaf, creator of medals, gave a talk about medals. Um, so I guess we're kind of double dipping. But uh, it's fine, because uh, his talk was awesome. Please check it out. Uh, it's about how Scala IDs have evolved and will continue to evolve in the future. Um, so previously, we were the advanced Scala tools team. And then we expanded our territory to other languages, because we decided that, oh, hey, we could just support the entire company. Um, but in ver so, so we're still a tooling team. It's just that we're, uh, we're focused on all the developers. And speaking of tooling, I have inadvertently worked on tooling at my previous projects and my previous companies. I just didn't call it tooling. I just did not know there was this word tooling. Well, I didn't know, but I thought it was like this boring word that was like carpentry or something. I don't know. Um, but it turns out, stuff like compilers, editors, all part of developer tooling, because developers always have to work with these tools. Um, so in terms of compile times, I have complained about them for several years. Uh, so this started when I was working in Java. And the Java uh, compile time was four minutes on my dual core MacBook. And then I begged my manager to give me a quad core MacBook, which promptly brought the times to two and a half minutes. So I was like, yes, I can actually like, uh, save some time when I changed my branches, because I had like five feature branches open at any given time. Um, and as for CI times, I was like, man, 20, 25 minutes to like do a, do a quick over on a PR? Never. And then I started Scala and realized that that was amazing. 20, 20 minutes, wow. I'm, right now I'm at an hour. Um, and my clean compile times are like 11 minutes. Yeah, so that, that was not great for the Scala story. Um, but I don't think I really need to motivate compile times anymore. Like, I think everyone can agree that faster compile times uh, is generally better for developer experience. So how are we going to actually attack this problem of faster compile times? Um, it's going to be a little different than Howie's talk yesterday uh, from Databricks. Um, it's going to focus on outlining a lot more than remote execution, and other possible technologies. So the agenda is going to be, first, introduction to and the history behind RSC and outlining, its current status in the eco, uh, Scala ecosystem, and then challenges we face in productionizing a uh, separate outliner. And finally, can you use outlining today? Um, I think that's pretty important uh, for, for us to say, hey, listen, this thing actually provides any value at all. So let's jump into it. So who knows what outlining is or has heard of outlining? Just raise your hands. All right. Just a select few of you. Uh, what about RSC? Have you guys heard of RSC? Surprisingly, more of you. <laughs> That's really surprising. Um, and what about C++ headers? Who's heard of that? All right, now who wishes they never heard of that? Keep your hands. Oh, yeah, there you go. All right, nice. So we'll, we'll be talking about this uh, very shortly. So what is RSC? RSC is an experimental Scala compiler uh, for the goal of faster compilation speed. And I, I really want to stress the two uh, things up here that are in bold, so experimental and compilation speed. So it's not a fork of the Scala compiler, but rather a rewrite of it from first principles with a different uh, goal in mind. <laughs> so the goal in mind is just compilation speed and how we're going to actually do it. Well, at first, RSC was actually a type checker. So why was it a type checker? The research goal of RSC is 5 to 10x compilation speed. So you know, like 500% to 1,000% speed ups. These are huge, huge numbers. Why do we even think that we could get close to this? So Gregor Kalsikowski, sorry if I butchered the name, uh, did a little experiment on Scala type checking a few years ago. He called it Kentucky Mule. And it was to explore the limits of the type checking speed. And he was able to get purported numbers of 40 times faster than the official Scala compiler just for type checking. Of course, this was a very limited type checker, but it still was 
like a monumental, like 40x, wow. Um, almost two orders of magnitude, right? And part of his testing, he uh, looked at Java C benchmarks versus Scala C uh, for very similar semantic programs. And he found that Java C was six times faster to compile even the simplest of programs, which is like a scathing review of uh, Scala's compile times. Um, so this, is, this provides a pretty good upper bound of what we can, might expect. It's a little disingenuous because Java itself was designed for fast compiles. Uh, but it, 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 I would say it serves as a good motivation for what we may wish to do. So I said RSC started out as a type checker, but then what happened? Uh, if you look in the RSC repo now, it doesn't really, it doesn't have a type checker. Um, so what the way that this kind of evolved was you, we, we actually had to um, produce value in a company. So wow, uh, never heard of that before. I'm joking. Um, so Twitter Stu Hood, who is the lead of the build team here at Twitter, um, he looked into how C++ builds, how large C++ builds are done, and realized that it was highly parallelizable because C++ files only depend on the header files for compilation. So bright idea, what if we produce C++ header files, except we call them Scala header files? Um, and in fact, instead of Scala header files, we called them outlines. So that's how um, outlining came to be. So instead of a fast type checker, we decided to evolve RSC into a fast outliner. Um, okay, so what is what do these outlines even look like? Well, you have normal Scala code, hopefully normal, uh, on the slide. And this is what the outlines look like. So we have these public type signatures um, and a bunch of class definitions and scopes. And on the lower right, you see that we uh, don't look at invisible members, so some, for example, private devs. Um, and we gloss over a lot of uh, details, like the implementation details of uh, the right-hand sides of these definitions. So we, we can save a lot of work. Um, and we can pretty much skip type checking and thus type inference and cogen and pretty much most of the compiler. So yeah, that's the one weird trick where you just like delete most of the compiler and you make it faster. It's pretty cool. Uh, but okay, so we delete <laughs> most of the compiler. How do we actually make use of this thing? Uh, so this is a hypothetical uh, Scala project. Let's just say it has like four targets. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, illustrate how outlining plays into uh, faster compiles. So a target you can think of it as a collection of files that may have crazy interdependencies. So they get compiled uh, in the same uh, compiler invocation, and targets can depend on each other. And in a monorepo, you have lots of these targets. <coughs> Sorry, and. The, these dependencies mean that they cannot start compilation until their well their dependencies finish compile. So in our illustration, B and C depend on A. So A has to compile first. B and C will continue compiling afterwards in parallel, and then D will start compiling after C is finished. So this is a normal Scala compile. Let's just say it takes like 4.5 seconds or something. And if we have outlining, then what we would do is actually we reduced the time to compile by 50%. Uh, or, well, reduce it by 33%. Uh, outline, this is under the assumption that outlining is twice as fast as a typical Scala compile. Um, so we actually outline and compile in parallel, but notice that B and C do not depend on A's compiles anymore, but rather the outline of A. So it can start earlier. And in the previous graph, we, sh we have uh, two cores available parallelism. So we have two tasks running at any given time. Whereas in this graph, we see that there's actually four tasks running at any given time. Now that's not the full story either because yes, we have four tasks that are running at any given time, but it's only really the middle parts that are, uh, so that middle one second of time that uh, our four cores may be fully saturated but what we care about is the effect of parallelism. So in fact, if outlining was even faster, if it was, let's say, instead of twice as fast, it was 10 times as fast, then we would have more effective parallelism 
and we get down from 4.5 seconds to 2 seconds. Um, and an interesting thing to note is that D, which st started out finishing last because it was all the way at the end of the uh, dependency graph, now finishes even before A, which started compilation first. So just a interesting to know about uh, interesting thing to know about the property of outlining when it's uh, when it gets as fast as ten times faster. And in fact, we can go even further than this. So it turns out that what if you just make a compile of a target depend on the outline of itself? Um, that's kind of interesting. So that means that we can actually split up the target as much as we want. So in this case, we split up the target into two parts. Um, and we call this sub-target parallelism because now we're uh, parallelizing within the target as well. Um, and you see that this gets us down even further, despite uh, the, sub -tar uh, the outlining overhead being now 20%. So it's only five times faster. And in a parallel uh, world, you'll find that contention will actually slow down your outliner by a significant amount because it's so fast already. So this 10% to 20% number may seem like, OK, we're, we may be just playing in random numbers, but actually you can see some sort of effect like this in real life. Of course, it won't be like twice as slow, but something like that. And in theory, since outlining uh, is the serial portion of a compile, you can think of it like that, then you can parallelize these sub-targets into as many little parts as you want, except you can't because there's overhead to actually starting these compiles, but in theory, you can. So how does this actually get us faster compiles, right? Like we, in this chart, we have eight cores worth of parallelism. And thankfully, now MacBooks can have up to eight cores. Um, but in the past, it wasn't always the case. And, what, and this was a very simple project, right? Like it just had four, tar, uh, four targets. What if we had a huge project? How would we have the core count to actually deal with this? So that's where distributed uh, compilations come in. And Stu gave a talk at Scala Days back in June about this. Um, it really focuses on the confluence of three separate technologies. So we have RSE outlining to unlock faster compilation. Well, that's cool, but how do we actually use it is we need the build tool to change the way that invokes the compiler uh, in order to serve an outlining workflow or a pipeline compile. And thirdly, we need remote executions to take advantage of the available parallelism now, that we now have in the project. Um, and really, it's all these three things that come together to give you faster compile times. Um, as Howie showed yesterday, instead of a remote execution, you could, in theory, have a huge box and just uh, parallelize over all the cores. Um, but we won't really get into that until maybe if you guys have questions about it later. So. That's really great. Why don't we have this yet? Um, turns out that when you throw away most of the compiler, uh, you get a bunch of drawbacks. Um, so these are some of the drawbacks. One is, right, we threw away the type checker. We don't have any type checking, so no type inference. Um, public return types now need to be uh, explicitly ascribed. And it's not just public. It turns out it's visible, so protected, and a few more types. Um, and also, macros. So what's a macro story here? Macros require full bytecode, so it can't depend on outline. Specifically, macro implementations, uh, right, when you're implementing a macro, you actually need the full bytecode of your dependency, unless you don't depend on anything for the macro, uh, which in practice, this seems to be more the case. Um, but this is something to think about. The, you, you need a transitive dependency tree. So they could, this could break your outlining workflow. Cool, so that's a bunch of hypotheticals. What is the reality of it all? Right? This is Twitter's response to lower compile times. What is the community's response? Right? It's not uh, parallel compiles are not just something that Twitter thought of, uh, of, obviously. So there's a bunch of related work. As mentioned before, at top of the list is C++ headers. So C++ headers and the way that it kind of uh, compiles has been around for a long, long time. And interestingly, Google actually has a header compiler or outliner for Java called Turbine. Um, it's still experimental. They're, the work on it is still, um, I'm actually not sure how much work is necessary for Google to adopt it. Um, but also, Bazel has iJars. But in terms of pure Scala work, 
Um, in, in the Scala ecosystem, there are three major related technologies. So one is Hydra, and that's a parallel Scala compiler. Uh, it was built by Julian Dragos and Mirko Dada from EPFL. Sorry if name pronunciation is bad. Uh, and the idea is it just works. It just works as a drop-in replacement for the Scala compiler. And then we have Bloop, which is a build server. Uh, and it was mentioned in Olaf's talk, actually. So this is the same thing that Olaf was talking about with integration to metals and VS Code and better IDEs. Uh, Bloop is actually a pioneer of build pipelining in Scala. So it was one of the first prototypes that actually made this type of workflow. Uh, it was a technical proof of this type of workflow. And in contrast to our outlining techniques, Bloop's pipelining is all in-memory data. So there, we can make it work with remote executions. Um, it's just less, uh, there, there's more work to be done in that area. Um, outlines, by contrast, are actual files that are produced by an outliner. And as of Scala 2.12.9, Scala C can actually now function as an outliner. Um, and this is all due to the work of Jason Zog uh, at Retronym. And this is really great stuff because it means that outlining is now part of the official compiler. Um, you don't need any bespoke technologies to uh, experiment with it. Although it is you know, behind the dash Y experimental uh, option. But it has great properties. So the generated outlines from this conform to Scala, meaning that they are correct. And you can use them for later compiles. So remember the outlining graph, you can just, it just works. Um, so does that mean that RSC outlines are not correct? Yes, it does. Um, but it's not correct in a, in a few buggy ways. But it does not mean that we do not have correctness in RSC. As an example, we have compiled a 300,000 lines of Scala project with RSC um, with no bytecode errors. So back to why outline, though. Since type checking is only skipped for definitions with type descriptions, so the way that this is implemented is it just skips type checking if it sees a type uh, that is explicit. And what that means is type inference is still there. It's just that if you add the type, it will be a bit faster. Um, we still need uh, to worry about macro expansions. Um, and actually, the outlines it produces aren't dot class files, but rather dot sig files, which Scala C understands. Um, but other tools will need to uh, have a little additional work to integrate. So that's really nice. How do we actually ship? Um, so this is kind of going to focus on RSE uh, and the challenges we had in, in shipping an outliner. And OK, so these are the three ingredients that we mentioned uh, from Stu's talk. Uh, basically, you need RSC compatibility, so explicit result types. You have to deal with macros. You need the build tool uh, to understand how to invoke the outliner and compiler in the correct order, uh, caches, dependencies, et cetera. And you need remote execution or a sufficiently large box. Except you don't only have three things, because uh, when shipping, you have validation issues and user experience issues. Uh, so, wow, the users. Uh, except this is also still not enough, because remember, the, the goal of all this was performance. You're supposed to actually deliver some value uh, to your users. And this, is, uh, this, this means that there are six things that we have to kind of think about. And this is what we mean by RSC compatibility. So let's just kind of like go through the things that are necessary on the RSC front. Um, or the outlining front. So this is an example of a publicly ascribed return type. So instead of just that foo, it's go to whatever. You actually need to have a type. You know, it's of type sequence of string. And we have an automatic Scala fix rule that can actually as ascribe these types for you. So you just run Scala fix. Um, it's great. 99% uh, of issues are pretty much caught. There are a couple things with like refined types and like existential existentials, but most things are they just work out of the box. Um, but that's also not the full story, right? Like this, this previous thing is, OK, what is stuff that map, whatever, oh, who knows? Um, but it's not so good when you have something like defx my class is called new my class. 
you know, we've basically devolved into Java at this point, um, which is not something we want to tell Scala developers. Um, and uh, the second example is, this is not in any version of Finagle. Uh, so uh, this full disclaimer, this is just an illustration. But this is what one of the types in Twitter's Finagle library would look like if you ascribe the public return type. Um, yeah, have fun uh, putting that in your PR. And again, visible members are actually not all the things that you need. It's everything with type inference. So for example, if I have a class with a constructor that uh, takes a T, then, and I extend that class with a init, then actually it, it uh, infers that the type of the class is bar of int. So you need to actually ascribe this. Well, the Scala fix rule needs to ascribe this, really. Um, so besides RSC compat, which is a Scala fix rule, what if we just wanted to have explicit result types? So Scala fix comes with a built-in rule called explicit result types. And as of 098, um, Olaf has made great contributions in the use of this rule. Um, so you can, and then this is just a Scala fix rule that you can use with a lint, but you can actually enforce such a, a rule at compile time. So have a compile error with wart remover's public inference uh, rule. And this may be interesting if you use Scala C Y outline, because then you can enforce public return types to prevent any backslide from uh, performance issues if people start forgetting uh, return types everywhere. So validation, just really quick, how do you validate code? Well, you have tests. But now we're rolling out an entirely new front end. So how, how are we going to make sure that we don't destroy Twitter? Um, so one is you can check bytecode, right? You run a normal compile, and you run your outlining workflow compile, and then you just check the bytecode. That's really great, except you just built your artifacts twice. Probably like the thing we don't want to do. Um, you can actually also just check your outline. So remember, I said that uh, the Y outline uh, outlines were perfect, and you could just use them right off the bat. Well, it turns out that that means you only depend on outlines, and if your outlines are correct, then your bytecode is correct. And what about the user experience? So as mentioned, you can actually make this a compile error. So if you outline with RSE, it actually just emits this compile error, says, hey, no, we didn't have a type here. Um, here's the line. Here's the thing you need to ch you change. And what removers public inference rule will give you a very similar output. And OK, so let's get into can we actually use this thing? So I, I talked a lot about, oh, yeah, this is the theory. This is the ideas. What about the use of this? Well, yes, you can use it today. Uh, the newest pants will support outlining workflows and both RSC and also Scala C's dash Y outline. However, caveats exist everywhere. Uh, so macros, again, you have to annotate your targets. Uh, well, that's one way to fix it. Just annotate which targets must be run with a full compile. And also performance. Like, yes, you can, but why would you? Unless you have good enough performance numbers uh, that you'll be able to convince people, hey, just put all your result types in your code. So what are our, our performance numbers? Well, we have a 25% speed up on 16 cores. So these are 16 physical cores, not hyper-threading. Um, and this is on 300,000 lines of code for Scala. Uh, the actual lines of code in a project, I think, is 400,000. Um, so that includes Java um, and other languages. And this number, this 25% speed up, is just very experimental. So uh, make of that what you will. But this is like a technically proven speed up. Uh, and this is without remoting. Uh, but if we had even more cores, then perhaps we could do even better. Um, so. Actually, what about a more normal target where you don't have 300,000 lines of code? This is an even more experimental number, but this is something that I can run on my laptop. You know, you can ship to users, uh, and they won't see a slowdown. Although this is on 88,000 lines of code for Scala, um, and the reason you would see this 16% uh, speed up for a smaller code base is it inherently has less parallelism until you use outlining. Whereas a 300,000 lines of code code base, well, there's a lot of things that are depending on everything. And it has much more parallelism to offer right off the bat. Um, this is super experimental numbers, but I thought it would be good to share our results so far. 
Um, so performance, actually, you, you can talk about other things regarding performance, right? We've been talking about compilation performance a lot, but what about ID startup time, indexing time, cache fetch time for remote caches? And it turns out outlining can possibly help in this regard as well because of lower jar sizes. So the class files, uh, full class files is by code, um, right? The factor between that and outline only class files is a 4x factor. And for dash y outline, so dot sig files, is a 9x factor. And then, so I also added the semantic DB outlines, which is something that RSE can produce. Um, and in fact, RSE does this thing where it creates semantic DB information and then turns it into uh, outline information. Uh, and that's a factor of 31x. What does this actually mean? So currently, IntelliJ supports class files. Right? You can just have class files, and uh, IntelliJ will index them and create uh, information from them to allow you to use uh, those signatures when you're editing. So like when you're, uh, when you're auto completing, when you're going to definition, uh, you can actually use these outlines. If your outlines are much smaller, then IntelliJ could, in theory, index faster. Um, and also, maybe if you needed to fetch from your cache, you could download things faster if you have a worse in, uh, Wi-Fi connection. And the dot .sig outlines produced by, uh, by Scholacy, well, IntelliJ doesn't understand them just yet. The reason I highlight them in yellow is because there is a, there's a ticket on Utrack that uh, IntelliJ may or may not, the people at JetBrains may or may not wish to fix, where they can understand dot .sig files. So this gives you another factor of 2x smaller jar sizes. So in summary, that was a lot of info, but in summary, we want to say, hey, RSC is this real thing, and it has given us real results for numbers. Um, it's a, I think it's a great experimental platform for hacking on um, performance experimentations. Outlining is a real thing. We have it in the official Scala compiler. We have a productionized build tool that has an outlining workflow working. Um, and I think we can be quite optimistic about the future of Scala compiles. Um, outlining is a great advantage that I think will um, prove its worth in the, in the future. And even now, we have a technical proof of, of its advantages. Um, and this work has a lot of con contributions, right? It's not just me or my team or even just the author of RSC. There's a lot of people who have uh, contributed to well, Scala, because they, uh, Martin, he created Scala. And then a lot of people have uh, contributed to faster compile times, faster build times, uh, just a lot of great uh, contributions from everywhere. Um, so thank you for coming to my talk. I don't know if we have. Okay. Yeah. Don't know if we have time for questions, but OK. Uh, if there's any questions, I can, I can take them now. Just raise your hand. Uh, yes? Let me bring the mic over to you. How sensitive is the um, generation of outline based on the complexity of the type signatures? For example, if I added contravariance and covariance and multiple you know, functors in the type? So I don't think it actually depends on the complexity of type. And the reason behind this is there's no type checking. So you have to explicitly uh, give, give me the type, or like give the outliner the type. And well, it's very simple. I just say, oh, yeah, OK, I'll just trust you. No, Scalacy does do that. It just skips type checking. Yes. One thing that you showed was a, you know, the, the, the two-phase compilation depends on building the DAG first of the files that you're going to compile, and then you, you call the compilation. Can RSC take a set of files, just like as a, if I wanted to use it as a tool to plug into some developer tool, can it spit out that DAG for me relatively easily? Uh, no, it's, it's not a build tool. So no, no, I, I understand that. What I, what I, what I want is for I, I input list of Scala files, output DAG of Scala files the dependency graph of those Scala files? Because clearly you have it because you build ah, it. OK. Um, no, Out RSC cannot output that. That's a pretty interesting idea, though. Like, we could actually just make that happen, um, if that's useful in some way. So a better answer may be RSC can output uh, semantic DB and the outlines. And there's a bunch of tools that use semantic DB to build up a possible DAG. 
Um, yeah. The only problem with that, though, is uh, you can have dependencies in like in the implementations of methods. So I'm not sure if outlines would be sufficient for your use case. All right. Any other questions? Nope. Perfect. Great. Thanks, Wynn. All right. Thanks, everyone.